With the end of the Ice Age, and the emergence of modern climate conditions and plant and animal communities, people began to use a more diverse range of plants and animals rather than being specialized big game hunters. In this lecture, we will use the southwestern United States as an example of how people use the diverse resources available in their environment. First, we will look at different foraging strategies that guided people's movements across the landscape in search of wild plants and animals that they could use. Then we will look at the diverse range of environments that are created in the southwest by different changes in elevation and how this led to different distributions of useful plants and animals. And then we will look at some of the different plants and animals that were important for foragers in the United States Southwest. Finally, you will go out on your own and do your own foraging exercise looking for some of these wild plants in your own environment. The end of the Ice Age also saw the end of the Paleo-Indian big game hunting adaptation as species like mammoth and bison went extinct. People began to use a wider range of plant and animal resources, and anthropologists know these as broad spectrum foragers. Broad, as in wide, spectrum, range of resources that would be collected. It reflects a greater knowledge of the local environment and the different uses that the available plants and animals could be put to. This hunter-gatherer adaptation lasted in the southwest from about 8000 BC until the introduction of maize around 2200 BC. It is referred to as the Archaic Period. This adaptation persisted in other areas like the Great Basin to the north until contact with Euro-Americans and the confinement of these Native American foragers upon reservations. In the southwest, the Yavapai, Pai, and Apache, while practicing some corn agriculture, still used a lot of wild plants and animals, and even dedicated agriculturalists like the Hopi also used quite a few wild plants and animals. So we have quite a bit of knowledge from these peoples about how plants and animals were used. The archaic populations in the southwest still maintained a high degree of residential mobility, moving around their territories in order to gather the available plants and animals. But they were moved within smaller ranges than the earlier Paleo-Indian people, who moved a lot further over the course of the year following the animals that they used. And we see this in less use of exotic raw materials coming from great distances uh, when they are making flake stone tools, suggesting that people are not traveling as far to gather these resources. They're also not traveling as far to collect the other resources they're gathering from the environment, like plants and animals. The idea of a seasonal round and resource scheduling are very important in order to understand foragers and their strategies for collecting resources from the environment. The seasonal round refers to how foragers move through their territory in accordance to the seasonal availability of resources, because some resources are just available for a very brief period of time, and some are also only available in very specific areas, so you have to move through your territory in order to be at these places at the time that the resources become available. So movements are said to be patterned by resource scheduling. So you schedule your movements around your territory to the location of particular resources that are known to be available at the times that they will be available. Foraging can be seen as being either targeted or opportunistic. So targeted is when you are seeking specific resources at a specific known location. So for example, if we had lived as a hunter-gatherer band here in the Phoenix area, 6,000 years ago. Over the past couple of weeks, we probably would have done targeted foraging for saguaro cactus fruit. Saguaro cactus fruit become available in a very narrow range of time just before the monsoon storms, and we would have moved into the foothills of mountains like South Mountain, where there are more saguaro cacti available than down in the lower basin areas. So we would have moved to a specific location at a specific time in order to gather specific resources. It is targeted. Foraging can also be 
opportunistic, where you gather any available resources as they are encountered. So in the early spring, maybe I wake up and I go out and I figure I'm going to go out and see what I find. I know that there's berries that are starting to become available and starting to ripen. So I will see what I can find. I also know that are, there are greens that are beginning to emerge and grow. So I'll see what I can find. But I'll also pack my rabbit stick because if I find a rabbit, I'm not going to pass up that opportunity. So this is an idea of opportunistic foraging. Maybe having some general idea what you're going to look for, but taking whatever you can find. These different approaches and also the different resources that are being gathered may lead to the application of different mobility strategies. Sometimes you might move the entire camp and everyone moves from camp to camp in order to follow the available resources. Other times you might establish a base camp from which smaller groups would go to gather resources in different areas and these base camps would serve as logistical uh, processing areas where you would bring all the resources you collected back to in order to process perhaps preparing them for storage in other areas or consumption immediately. So these different mobility strategies can lead to archaeological sites that may differ based upon the season that they're occupied, the different subsistence activity that's pursued, and the different tool types that might be used. Also, how frequently were the sites used? How long did people live there? Did they return to them year after year, or was one that was just used for maybe a week and never revisited? The Greater Southwest is said to extend from north to south, from Durango, Colorado, to Durango, Mexico, and from east to west, from Las Vegas to Mexico, to Las Vegas, Nevada. Now this map only goes to the U.S. border. It goes no further south than the Tortilla Curtain, so rather than Durango to Durango, it's more like Durango to Douglas, Arizona. But this area contains three different physiographic provinces that create Eight, quite a bit of physical relief and differences in elevation that creates many different environmental zones. We have the basin and range zone, the Colorado Plateau, and the transition zone between them. Mesa and Phoenix are within the basin and range zone. It is a low desert that has these structural basins created by mountain ranges that define their boundaries. The mountain ranges are often parallel to one another because of the faulting activity that uplifted the mountain ranges and led to sinking of the areas between. This tectonic activity be followed by erosion that fills these basin in. The precipitation is relatively low, averaging only 4 to 12 inches per year. This aerial photo shows the sort of characteristic parallel ranges within the basin and range region. So we see these mountain ranges with basins in between, and these in southern Nevada have dry lakes between them. These lakes sometimes have water during the rainy season, and during the Pleistocene, when things were much wetter, they often had year-round marshes, but now they have dried out in these, in these basins between the mountain ranges. The Colorado Plateau includes much of northern Arizona and the rest of the Four Corners region. It is high elevation, mostly flat, uplifted tableland of sedimentary rocks like sandstones with deep canyons incised and defining mesas, but there are also volcanic fields creating mountains. Precipitation varies with the elevation and rain shadow, and there can be an average from 6 to 30 inches from the lowest valleys to the highest peaks. It is all relatively high elevation, more than 5,000 feet, more than a mile high, and most places see some winter snow. This view of Monument Valley is an iconic view of the Colorado Plateau, with the uplifted sedimentary rocks creating mesas, erosion, creating these spectacular formations, and in the background you can see the Abajo and La Plata Mountains, volcanic mountains on top of this flat plateau. The transition zone is the low rugged mountains that exist between the basin and range and the Colorado Plateau. It is also an ecological transition zone between low elevation and high elevation plant communities and often has intermixtures of these different plant communities creating greater diversity in this area. In the 1890s 
naturalist C. Hart Merriam came up with the life zone concept. He was working in the Flagstaff area, and he noted a relationship between change in elevation and changes in plant community as you move from low elevations to higher elevations. And he believed that from the low to high elevation in the southwest is almost equivalent to a trip from the Arctic Circle to central Mexico. So starting at the top of the San Francisco peaks, it's like the Arctic Circle. And going downward in elevation to the Little Colorado River, it becomes more like central Mexico. Miriam defined six different environmental zones based upon these differences in plant communities. Lower Sonoran, Upper Sonoran, Transition, Canadian, Hudsonian, and Arctic Alpine. These changes in elevation create vertical distribution of resources, and the maturing of resources in these different environmental zones occurs at different time periods because differences in the length of winter, the changes in temperature, and the maturation of the plants in these different areas. And so you can follow upwards in elevation in the spring and into the summer the availability of different plant resources and then work your way back down through the fall and into the winter and spend your winters in lower elevations. Lower Sonoran is low desert with creosote bush and bursage and not much else. There are not many resources in much of the lower Sonoran zone. The upper Sonoran in the foothills surrounding the bottoms of the basins is much more diverse with different tree and cacti and shrub species that provide different types of fruits and bean pods and other resources. The transition zone is very rugged and has an intermixture of higher elevation and lower elevation plant species. It is generally characterized by what we call chaparral with a mixture of juniper, oak, and pine, and other small shrubs. The Canadian zone is the pine oak forest like you find around Flagstaff, Arizona. And while there are fewer edible wild plants in this life zone, as you go up in elevation there are more large game species that could be hunted. Higher up on some mountains, you reach the Hudsonian zone, which has spruce, fir, and aspen trees. And again, fewer edible plant species, but on these high mountains that are often medicinal plants that can only be found in these high elevation areas. And at the tops of the San Francisco peaks, Mount Baldy, and some other peaks in the southwest, you go above tree line and reach an Arctic alpine environment, where there are plants that can only be found on the tops of these mountains and much further north in the Arctic areas. Some of these plants are also useful as medicinal plants. So let's look at some of these useful wild plants and animals and talk about how they were used and when they are available. I gave the example of saguaro earlier. The fruits and the seeds contained within the fruits were eaten. And since the fruits grow way up on top of these tall columnar cactus, a special tool had to be made from the ribs of down saguaros in order to pull the fruits off where they would be caught below by children with five-gallon plastic buckets. Well, in prehistory they probably used baskets. The fruits were made into a fermented beverage by autumn people here in southern Arizona, and this fermented beverage would be drunk during ceremonies, and only during these ceremonies. Saguaro fruits become mature, mature and become available just before the arrival of the monsoon rains, and this was seen as a way of bringing the monsoon rains by fermenting a beverage and drinking it until your body exploded with moisture the same way that a cloud bursts exploded with moisture by vomiting, because you drank too much. Almost all species of cactus have edible fruit, and prickly pear were some of the most important cacti for bearing not just edible fruit, but also the pads could be eaten. The young pads, before they develop the spines, are edible, and you may have eaten them. They're known as nopales in Hispanic cooking. Choya fruits were also eaten, and they were gathered using special tongs made usually from the ribs of saguaro. In order 
order to keep you away from all the spines that are on a choya plant. The spines are also found on the fruits, so the fruits had to be charred on a bed of coals in order to remove those small spines before consumption. Fruits of cacti could be dried and preserved uh, for later consumption. They could also be boiled down in order to reduce them into a syrup that was e more easily preserved than the fresh fruits. Mesquite trees have edible bean pods, and it's the flesh of these pods that are edible, not the seeds within, which are hard as rocks. A meal was made from the pods. Uh, they would pound them within mortars and pestles, then remove the outer husk and remove the seeds, leaving behind this flour. It could be cooked into breads or as dumplings, and it was even made into a shake-like beverage, one of the original power smoothies. They taste a lot like starchy Granny Smith apples, in my opinion. You can go find a mesquite tree and check them out yourselves and tell me what you think they taste like. You can also buy mesquite flour at Whole Foods and other natural food stores. It's emerging to be a uh, popular gluten-free flour. Pinion nuts were a very important resource because they are high in protein and also high in fats. They could also be stored for long periods of time. Uh, the nuts are found within the pine cones themselves. And the trees don't produce lots of pine cones every year. They do it on a cycle on average of about every seven years. They produce tons of pine cones. In nut-bearing trees, this is called a high mast year. And most tree species that produce seeds and nuts go through these cycles of every three to seven years or so. They produce lots and lots of nuts or seeds as a way to sort of overwhelm all of the natural predators in the environment, all the rodents and birds that prey upon their seeds. And every few years they produce so many that at least a few of them are going to go into the ground and sprout and become the next generation of trees. Now people can monitor different stands of pinyon pine through the spring and early summer in order to figure out which are the ones that are going to have this high mass year. And so they can plan where they should go in the fall in order to gather pinyon pine nuts. Pine nuts were not just an important resource here in the U.S. Southwest. They also grow in the Mediterranean region, and they are a component of many uh, Italian and Spanish foods. And if you had a traditional basil pesto, it is basil, olive oil, garlic, and pine nuts. The different species of juniper that are found here in the Southwest were very useful because the berries could be eaten, the leaves and the sap could be used medicinally, and the bark was used for a variety of purposes in weaving, particularly weaving mats and sometimes even used to make clothing. The leaves can be boiled to create a tea that is very high in vitamin C. And the berries, while edible, are very strongly flavored, but they are also uh, very high in vitamin C. If you have ever had a drink of gin, you know what juniper berries taste like, because those are used to flavor gin. A wide variety of shrubs with berries are found in the U.S. Southwest, and these provided important sources of vitamin A and C when they become mature in the early spring. On the left we see wolfberry, which is very common in the deserts around Phoenix. And if you go on a hike in the desert in the early spring, you'll see these bushes covered with red berries, attracting many birds to them. Uh, barberry is more common in the northern parts of the state and has leaves like holly. Uh, the berries start out yellow and then mature into this blue form. Barberry was also an important source of a, of a natural dye. Uh, the inner part of the stems and the roots is a very bright yellow and would be boiled in order to create a yellow dye. When I look at an agave plant, really the last thing I think of is, wow, that looks edible. It looks really spiny. And if you've ever had an up-close and in-person encounter with an agave spine, you know that they hurt. But the heart of the agave is very high in sugar and other carbohydrates just prior to when it would send up its flower stalk. Uh, so an agave plant on the left is a one that is growing and maturing, and after a period of 3 to 20 or more years, depending upon the species, it will send up a flower stalk, as you see on the right, and then after it 
blooms and produces a crop of seeds from the flowers, it will then die. And the goal for people who are going to consume these plants is to find ones just before that flower stalk is going to come up. And like some of the mast-bearing nut trees, agave and stands often synchronize their flowering. And so you can go and you can look and look for clues at the top of the agave where the upper leaves are as to whether it is going to send up a flower shoot that season. Start monitoring them in the spring, determine where the most productive stands of agave are going to be, and then schedule your movements to those locations in the early part of the spring when they're going to uh, be available. Agave is still used by many native groups in the southwestern U.S. and northern Mexico. And here we see a Kumeyaay man and woman in Southern California harvesting agave. The man, as you see, has a long sort of pry bar and it has a wedge-like spatulate end that he sends in in order to sever the single taproot of the agave and then flip it over so all those sharp pointy leaves are pointing away from him. You then cut off the leaves, creating the heart, which looks a little bit like a lo very large artichoke heart. And on the right you can see some of these hearts that have been roasted uh, in a Mexican market. And you would roast them, expose them to heat for a long period of time to fully convert all of the carbohydrates into sugars. In the early 1900s, photographer Edward Sheriff Curtis documented a traditional agave harvest on the San Carlos Apache Reservation here in Arizona. And we're going to look at this sequence of photos to appreciate the whole process of gathering and pr processing and preparing food from agave. First the agave was harvested by severing its taproot and here you can see an Apache woman using a much shorter stick than the Kumeyaay man in the earlier photo but she's also using a hammer stone in order to drive it in and sever the taproot. Here a pile of harvested agave hearts have been prepared for roasting by severing all of the leaves leaving just the hearts. The agave hearts were roasted in a large pit. This pit would be excavated and then lined with rocks that had been heated in a fire. And then a layer of wet grass would be put in, the agave hearts, another layer of wet grass, more heated rocks, and then a layer of earth on top of this. Once the pit was covered, it would be left for 24 to 48 hours, and the heat of the stones would then cook the agave within. While some of the agave was consumed immediately, much of it was preserved for later consumption. Here a woman is preparing a dried agave cake. The agave was pounded flat and then formed into these large cakes and dried in the sun. These dried cakes of agave could be stored for long periods of time and people would carry them to different places within their territory to stockpile it in dry caves in order to be used at later times. They would sort of arrange resources at places that they intended to go later, so when they arrived there, there would be agave waiting to be consumed, as well as the other resources that they would begin to collect in that area. When cutting the leaves off to expose the hearts, you didn't just throw those away. The leaves could be processed in order to get the fibers inside. The fibers could then be twisted into cordage, thread, and even woven into textiles. It was a fairly coarse and tough textile, a lot like canvas. Here we see an Atomi Indian man processing agave fiber first scraping the pulp off the leaves and then the exposed fibers are dried in order to prepare them for twisting into cordage or thread and potentially weaving them into textiles. Yucca was also an important source of fiber and food. Fibers could be removed from the leaves and twisted into cordage, but also the leaves themselves could be used in order to weave baskets. The flowers and fruits were also edible and the root was used to make a soap and a shampoo. Many grasses provided edible seeds, and Indian rice grass was perhaps one of the most important. It was so important that at Hopi there is a clan named after this plant. Wild sunflower seeds are smaller than those of the domesticated sunflower, and evidence from coprolites 
preserved human feces found in dry caves indicate that the hulls were eaten with the seeds. Amaranth was another important seed-bearing plant. In the fall, each plant produces thousands of easily collected but very small seeds. The scale in the photo of the seeds is one millimeter. These are small, shiny black seeds that look a lot like poppy seeds. But not just the seeds are edible, the greens are edible as well. Beginning in the spring, when they're first coming up and are still tender, they would be a very good source of vitamin A and C and calcium. Goosefoot, like amaranth, produces abundant, easily collected small seeds in the fall and also has edible, nutritious greens beginning in the spring. Goosefoot and amaranth might look familiar to you because they are very common disturbance weeds. They grow in areas that have been disturbed by human activity, and they are in the alleys in my neighborhood, and you might find them in the alleys in your neighborhood as well. Purslane is a small spreading succulent that is also often found in areas disturbed by human activity. It has edible leaves and edible seeds. The seeds, like those of amaranth and goosefoot, are very small, and in the photo of the plant in the very center you can see a seed pod that has opened up uh, with these small black seeds inside. Tansy mustard produces abundant seeds that are much smaller than the domesticated mustard seeds that you might have at home in your spice rack. Like amaranth and goosefoot, the leaves are edible as well. Tansy mustard was such an important wild food resource that both the Hopi and Navajo have clans named for this plant. Specialized seed gathering technology was developed in order to collect and process these small seeds because when you collect them you often get more than just the seed. You get the chaff, the bracts, the small leaf-like parts of the plant that enclose the seed. Now in this figure we see some Paiute women out gathering seeds. They are wearing baskets on their heads as hats, but they also have a large disc-shaped basket that they, would, they use to collect the seeds, and on their backs a large conical basket that they would put the seeds that they had collected in. And we see a seed beater on top that would be used to knock the seeds from the heads of the grass plants into the large uh, flat basket that they are carrying. And when they would return to camp, on the bottom is a winnowing basket almost like a sieve or a colander in order to help sort the uh, vegetable material out from the small seeds, the small leaf-like material that would be collected with the seeds. Wetlands are important areas not only as water sources for people and animals, but some of the plants that grew there were edible as well, like cattails and bulrush. The pollen and roots of cattail are edible, and bulrush have seeds that are edible. Ungulates are hooved mammals like deer, bighorn sheep, elk, and pronghorn. These animals can provide large amounts of meat, but there's the trade-off with the significant expenditure of effort required to hunt them. You often have to travel great distances to upland areas in order to find them, and it is easier to find them if you're cooperating in a group of hunters. The animals also have particular habits which can make them hard to find different, in different seasons. During most of the year they are widely spread across the landscape, but they come together in large groups in the fall when they are gathering to mate, and that is also when the meat and hides are at their highest quality. They have spent the whole summer eating lots of grass and browsing on lots of shrubs and trees, and they have packed on as much fat as they can in order to see them through the lean time of the, of the winter. And it is also when their hides have come to their best condition, also in preparation for the rigors of the winter. And so you can find them in one place, males and females all gathered together for the mating season, and also find them at their highest value in terms of the meat and the hides. Archaeologically, we can see the transition from hunting big game like and megafauna to smaller, still large game, like ungulates, deer, bighorn sheep, and others, in changes in projectile point technology. The size of the game hunted 
is reflected in the size of the point to some degree, but there are also changes in the propulsion technologies. How are you sending that sharp piece of rock flying at the animal that you are trying to kill? Uh, the earlier peoples used atlatls and darts, so the first four from the left are all would have been used with an atlatl and dart, while the smaller two on the right would have been used with a bow and arrow. A bow and arrow requires a smaller and lighter point. We can also see changes in the hafting methods. Hafting refers to the means by which your sharp pointy rock is going to be attached to the long stick, the shaft of the spear or arrow, that you're then going to propel at the animal you're trying to kill. You can see on the left the clovis point is fluted. Uh, the next two, a bajada and a San Jose point, are kind of stemmed, although the San Jose point also has kind of ears coming out uh, to assist in securing the point to your shaft. The next three uh, sort of build upon this having notches that assist where you're going to tie the point on to the shaft. These changes in hafting technology suggest different strategies adopted by different peoples who have come to different answers to a common problem. Deer and pronghorn were stalked by individual hunters who would wear deer head decoys. You can see in the upper left an Apache man demonstrating this, wearing a deer head decoy and walking bent over so that he would almost look like a deer to those that he's approaching. Deer actually have terrible eyesight. Their eyesight is very good for discerning movement, but it is not very good at giving them very crystal clear images of their surroundings. Deer have excellent hearing and pretty good sense of smell, but their eyesight, they can be easily fooled by a person wearing a deer head decoy, as long as you're downwind so they can't smell that you're a human. Wearing the decoy allows someone to get close enough to shoot the deer with a bow and arrow or an atlatl and dart and assure that they're going to get a kill shot that is going to hit the animal within its chest to hit the lungs and or heart and lead to the animal succumbing to the wound relatively quickly because you don't want to just gut shoot them or hit them in the leg and then have to track them for miles or perhaps days before you can catch them or before they succumb to the womb. Pronghorn could be trapped in corrals. Pronghorn do not jump over fences. If you've ever seen a pronghorn approaching a barbed wire fence, they go underneath them and they can actually do this while running. It's like they slide on their knees. The reason they don't jump is because their limbs are very lightly built. The bones are much thinner and lighter than the bones of deer or elk, who can jump very high fences. But pronghorn, their limbs are built for speed to allow them to run very fast, and they do not jump over things. So a low fence built out of brush is almost sufficient enough in order to catch pronghorn. You can see in this petroglyph a circular form with a funnel shape coming off in order to lead this herd of pronghorn into it where they would be trapped and then dispatched. We know historically that Paiute in the Great Basin and the Navajo did trapping of pronghorn using corrals like this. These are maps of historic ones that were found in northern Utah. As you can imagine, low brush walls do not preserve well over time, and these are very difficult features to identify archaeologically. While the corrals often are not identified, the remains of the pronghorn are and if you find a site with large numbers of pronghorns in the same age and sex categories, it suggests that a whole herd has been dispatched using perhaps some type of corral trap. 
While large game animals produce lots of high-value meat, they are sometimes difficult to find and require a lot of effort to travel the distances in order to find them. Rabbits and hares were perhaps more important prey species, as they are readily found in most areas year-round. They could also be hunted opportunistically during the course of other subsistence activities. They can be caught with snares, they can be driven in communal hunts into large nets where many can be hot at once, but most often they were dispatched with rabbit sticks. Cottontails are rabbits, which are smaller than hares, like the jackrabbit on the right. Not only are hares larger, there are some other differences in dentition that are not easily observed. Rather than trying to hit a small rabbit with a bow and arrow, rabbit sticks were the primary means of dispatching these animals. They would be just thrown at the animal in order to stun and possibly kill it upon striking it. And Hopi rabbit sticks, like this one, were angled like the wing of the prairie falcon, which is considered the greatest hunter of rabbits. And this is a form of mimetic magic that you can get the power of this animal hunter uh, within the instrument that you're using to hunt the same animal. Rabbits were communally hunted and driven into nets. These are nets that are about the height of a tennis net, but much longer. Uh, archaeological examples have been found that are more than a hundred yards long, and they used to be stretched out with stakes across an area, and then people would drive all the rabbits toward this net where they would be caught and then clubbed to death with rabbit sticks. This Native American method of communal hunting was adopted by early settlers in the western United States as a means of removing rabbits from their agricultural fields. They would seasonally have large rabbit drives and catch, in some cases, tens of thousands of rabbits. These rabbit drives were sometimes done in a circus-like atmosphere with competing teams trying to catch more rabbits than teams from other cities or towns nearby. Many other smaller rodents like prairie dogs, wood rats, gophers, squirrels, and mice were eaten as well, and we have coprolite evidence that indicates mice and other small rodents were sometimes eaten bones and all. And this may have been done during desperate times of food shortage or it may have been a preferred means of having a crunchy little roasted mouse. Rodents and other small mammals were usually caught with traps and snares. On the left we see a deadfall trap where a trigger of a series of sticks and a string have been used to prop up a large slab of rock. When an animal passes underneath the rock and trips the trigger, the rock falls and crushes them, hence the name deadfall trap. On the right is a loop snare which would be set up along a small pathway in the grass or shrubs that small animals would pass along. And when it passes through the loop it would strip the trigger which then has the bent sapling on top swing up pulling the noose tightly around the animal's neck and then you come back and gather either your crushed animal or your hung animal. Several snares could be set during the day and then checked the next morning to see what your success was. And archaeological examples of these different types of trigger trapping mechanisms have been found in dry caves. In desert areas, people didn't limit their protein choices to mammals. They also consumed some large reptiles, like the chuckwalla. It is a large lizard related to the iguana that can grow up to two feet long. The chuckwalla has an interesting adaptation. When threatened, it will run into crevices where it literally blows itself up in order to wedge itself in. So some southwestern peoples developed very specialized chuckwalla tools. These on the right, you see one of these sticks that has a pointed hook at the end that you would stick into the crevice, hook the chuckwalla, puncture it, deflate it, and then pull it out. Other reptiles that were eaten included desert tortoises 
and water turtles. In the Las Vegas, Nevada area, desert tortoises were an important source of protein for hunter-gatherers and also for early agriculturalists. In the early Holocene, wetlands were more extensive uh, as the ice sheets of the Pleistocene melted and before they evaporated, creating dry parts of the desert southwest that we know today. And these wetlands would have served as important stopover points in the flyways of different migratory waterfowl, uh, different species of duck and geese. From some cave sites in the Great Basin and the southwest, we have duck and goose decoys that in some ways are similar to ones that you might find at Bass Pro Shop today. In fact, you can identify the species that were mimicked in some of these. On the bottom left, you have necks that would be attached to floating parts of a body, and they are made to look like Canada geese. On the right, you have whole decoys that are made with feathers and painted to look like canvasback ducks. Like modern hunters, prehistoric hunters would put these decoys out in order to attract other ducks to land within range of the weapons or perhaps the snares or nets that they would use to trap them. So what to remember? Understand the relationship between a seasonal round and resource scheduling that foraging people use to schedule their movements across the landscape, moving through different seasons and being where different plants or animals were available at particular places and particular times. Hunter-gatherers needed to have an extensive knowledge of the life cycles of useful plants and animals in order to plan these seasonal rounds and schedule their collection of resources. Movements of hunter-gatherers in the southwest often involved shifting through different environmental zones at different elevations to acquire resources available in different seasons. Hunter-gatherers did not live a hand-to-mouth existence, constantly seeking out food, rather the use of reliable, predictable, and productive resources allowed subsistence needs to be met with less later inputs than later agriculturalists. Anthropologists studying modern hunter-gatherers living in desert environments like the Kalahari in Africa have found that they spend on average 9 to 16 hours per week on their subsistence needs. The modern work week for most of us is 40 or more hours not 9 to 16. Agriculture and the later complex societies that are based on it require more labor inputs than hunter-gatherers. And so we'll ask later, why did people ever make this change?